Thank you so much, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to Unity Spiritual Community in Citrus Heights, where all people are welcome, and where differences are celebrated as the splendor of God's creative expression. And happy Mother's Day. Unless it makes you grit your teeth like it does me, but we're just going to roll with that, okay? I know who you are. Here we go. <clears throat> Today's daily word. This is Sunday, May 9th, 2021, and the words for today are motherly love. I give thanks for motherly love. I give thanks for motherly love. God's perfect love expressing through my mother gave me life. God's love, wisdom, and strength guided her and all those who nurtured me as I grew. My words of praise and gratitude let me show my mother how much I appreciate her. When I wish to demonstrate my appreciation for my mother's example, I share the nurturing, mothering love of God in my words and actions with all people. Remembering the times when my mother or another compassionate person listened patiently and shared encouraging words, I seek to be a caring, supportive presence. Recalling my mother's joy each time I learned something new, I share my skills and knowledge willingly when someone seeks my help. In gratitude, I share the gift of nurturing love. And from Isaiah 66, 13, we read, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. So the words for today are motherly love. And now we invite our minister of music, Lisa Lawson, to perform another song for us.
Thank you, Lisa. So beautiful, so appropriate. Thank you. So our Sunday featurette today is called Expecting Adam. And this is one of the covers of the book. The book's been printed many times, so it has a variety of covers. It came out uh, at first in the 1980s when Martha Beck, that's the author, and her husband John were attending Harvard. They already had one daughter who was a toddler, and they both came from strict religious families in Utah. John and Martha were a couple obsessed with success. After years of matching IQs and test scores with less driven peers, they had two Harvard degrees apiece and were gunning for more. They plotted out a future in the most vaunted ivory tower of academe. But the dream had begun to disintegrate. Then when their unborn son, Adam, was diagnosed with Down syndrome, doctors, advisors, and friends in the Harvard community warned them that if they decided to keep the baby, they would lose all hope of achieving their carefully crafted goals. And fortunately, that's exactly what happened. Martha said, that she had to unlearn virtually everything that Harvard taught her about what is precious and what is garbage. Adam was often described as living in two worlds. Messages from Adam when he was in the womb and, and later when he was a toddler before he could speak Messages from Adam were delivered by strangers, sometimes the, the janitor in the school when Martha was attending classes, sometimes somebody she was interviewing for a totally unrelated purpose. He also appeared in dreams. Messages from and about him appeared in dreams, including when he told each of his parents in separate dreams that his name was Adam. And they had chosen another name. And then they had to talk about changing it, and they had to talk about the reason they needed to change it was that he had come in a dream. Sometimes he would appear in a dream as his adult self, even when he was still a little boy. And one of my favorite parts of this book is when he appeared in his father's dream. John was having a terrible dream about two jumbo jets colliding in midair and, and seeing the wreckage and the passengers falling to earth and being so upset and, and then noticing that there was someone standing next to him watching this. And he looked, and it was an adult version of Adam. And John said, isn't this horrible? This is just horrible. And Adam said, look at it this way. And as John looked again, each piece of the airplanes that fell to earth became part of a new terminal. And all of the passengers were just fine traveling through that terminal on escalators and moving sidewalks and getting on other airplanes and going to the gates to check in. And Adam said to John, you see, it's how you look at it because these people are going places they could have not reached any other way. This was in a dream. One of the other themes that is recurring in this book is about the Bunraku Puppet Masters. 
John especially, but John and Martha had spent time in Japan. And they had gone to see this um, stylized, ancient performing um, venue wherein the puppeteers are actually on the stage, usually covered in black, and they have these very elaborately dressed puppets that they position and move around and act out the play, and you soon forget that the people are on the stage with the puppets. They just become invisible. You just accept the theory that these puppets are moving. Martha felt Bunraku puppet masters at the conception of Adam. And I don't mean from Japan. She felt the invisible presence of otherworldly beings that were moving her and moving John into the acts that would create the future that they ended up with, that would recreate the child they ended up with. John felt the Bunraku puppet masters, symbolically, felt them take control of his car one time when it was headed for a big wreck, and they steered him around the danger. Another time, Martha was home alone, and she was pregnant, and she was sick, and the apartment building caught fire, and she needed to escape. So she took their daughter, she was about two years old, and started making her way down three flights of smoke-filled stairs, coughing and gagging and weak, and she didn't think she was going to make it, and it was dark, when all of a sudden she felt a very strong arm go across her back and provide her the support she needed. And then she felt this being hold her shoulders and brace her so that she could continue down the steps. And, and when she made it to the bottom of the stairwell and, and burst into the lobby of the building, there were TV cameras there filming everything. And when she looked at that film later, there was no one there behind her. And so we decided that this was the Bunraku showing up again in her life. I wanted to show you uh, current, fairly current pictures of Martha and Adam since the book is set in the, in the 80s. Adam always said he was going to go to Africa. He had dreams about animals. Martha went on to write many more books, including another memoir about leaving the Mormon church. And she became a columnist in more than one um, national magazines. I've seen her wor work in Good Housekeeping and O. So she had quite a career. And this is the cosmic child wanted to share some more things about Adam with you. When Adam was a baby and a toddler, he was about half the size as other kids his age. And Martha described him sprawling on his bed, his, his limber joints causing his arms and legs to lie at unusual angles, and his large head bent to one side. And as she stood over him, she said he was the most beautiful baby she'd ever seen. Happy Mother's Day. When he was in kindergarten, Adam began insisting that he wear business suits and shirts and ties to school and carry his work in a briefcase, and they found in the children's section at Robert Hall, suitable suits, little tiny suits for him to wear. 
and that was his favorite costume for years and years, even though they were a very casual family. He used to take his extra suit to school with him in his briefcase because there was another boy with Down syndrome and he would let that other boy wear it and they both wear their suits and then they would talk to each other in a language nobody else could understand. Those of us who have cared for special needs people or pets are familiar with the sweet, sweet love that we share with them. But Adam's story goes beyond this. He lives on both sides of the veil. In a dream, Martha asked Adam why he had chosen this life on earth. And he handed her a glowing scroll upon which she could read these words. The earth cries like a child and the blood of the animals is the blood of innocence. But you, having lost your innocence, cannot hear the cries or the blood as it beats in your own ears. It is to answer those cries that I have come as I have come. So far in our series uh, in our Adventures in Consciousness, we have discussed a couple of other atypical humans, some with dyslexia and some with autism. And next week, we're going to start including non-human consciousness in this adventure. And we're going to have a feature act called Psilocybin Speaks, in which this amazing plant tells us about its cosmic journey and its cosmic mission. So for now, this ends the feature at, and I thank you for listening. God bless you all.
Thank you. And now at this time, we take a moment to bless our prayer requests. So let's just all gather those into our consciousness this morning. Our concerns that we may have been having in the last few days or in this week. Let's draw those concerns into that loving heart of the mother that we're celebrating today, that exists within each one of us, around us. We connect and surround these concerns with love and support this morning, seeing all of our needs met all of our questions answered, seeing order wherever we look and approaching challenges with wisdom, approaching relationships with love and with peace. We give thanks for this love and this order that supports us and we release all of our concerns into the loving care of the Christ Spirit this morning. Thank you, God. Amen. And I'd like to remind you that for your individual prayer requests, anytime you may call Silent Unity at 1-800-NOW-PRAY, I invite you to do that. Now please join me in preparing for a time of meditation. Let us allow ourselves to gently slip into a time of quiet repose. We allow our thoughts to float by without concern or direction. We find that still point beneath our thoughts and rest in the serene silence here. Once we release our focus on the outer, we find that our personal identity is vast without the restriction of our cultural definitions. We come home to a self that is neither man nor woman, neither child nor adult, neither alive or dead. For we encompass all things, all times, and all places. We hear ourselves in the wind. We feel ourselves in the warm sunlight and the cool starlight. We see ourselves in the faces of all other beings. We have no fear, no worry. We are part of all that is. 
We came into form in the distant past with the birth of the cosmos. We have known countless expressions of awareness, both formed and formless. We are secure. We are eternal. Let us rest, rest, rocked in the cradle of the universe, lulled by the sound of sheer silence. As we return our focus to this one place, this one time, this one body, we feel ourselves assuming our earthly identities, woman, man, young, old, strong, or frail. Yet beneath this one self, this one lifetime, we feel the ever-present knowing that we have always been and will always be the omnipresent light of God, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Today's talk is part two in our series, our three-part series called Sacred Success. And it's based on this book, Sacred Success by Barbara Stanny, A Course in Financial Miracles. Last week, in Talk 1, we discussed the problem. The problem is that women and many other people do not accept their power. And this includes how to be fiscally successful. Today, in Part 2, we are looking at the process we can use to overcome the things that have held us back. This process, which was also called the heroine's journey, is comprised of four stages. The first is the call, the call to greatness. Every, every hero or heroine's journey begins with a call. The call to greatness, recognizing the call, responding to the call, and becoming responsible for fulfilling, for, full, for fulfilling the call. The second stage is called receptive surrender, which includes taking time for preparation, taking time for rest, and allowing the universe to support you. This third stage is disciplined action, Developing a strategy, carrying out the strategy, and financial planning. And the last stage is modeling greatness, knowing that we all leave a legacy, being mindful of your legacy, and being generous. Stanley discusses her desire to have millions of dollars and to help millions of people she is using one model of greatness and success. Her personal call to greatness was to make millions, to help millions, and to give millions. Much of the information in this part, in the process, is practical advice about how to make money, how to have investments and understand our economic systems. There are exercises in each chapter of the book, and it can be used as a workbook as you plan your life strategy. Most of the steps she shares can be applied even if your model of greatness does not include making millions of dollars or reaching millions of people. I really struggled with the idea of, of greatness and success as presented by the author. When most of us recognize our call to greatness, it does not include this kind of success. There are many definitions for prosperity. And one of my favorites is having what you need when you need it. There's nothing wrong with following Stanny's definition of greatness, unless it is not the same as your own. In studying the steps she includes in the process, I realized that I could identify three women in my own life who had modeled these steps in their own way and at various times in their lives. And so I'm going to share their stories with you. 
The first is my cousin Madeline. My cousin Madeline, after a divorce, moved to this area and bought a house in Valley Spring, which is in the foothills near San Andreas. After a few years, she realized that she couldn't afford the house. This was during the housing boom and crash. And she told me one day, and this is what has always tickled me, that she'd put it on her calendar to sit down and do some thinking that night. <laughs> she was going to sit and think about what she was going to do. That was her strategy, you see? She was strategizing. I just never heard anybody say that way and put it on her calendar. And she was able to sell her house and buy a double wide nice mobile home in a senior park where there were people she already knew and socialized with. And the park was in San Andreas exactly across the street from the county clerk's office where she worked. Now that is a model of greatness and financial success. It is on a scale that most of us can identify with. And it also addresses how you may go through this several times in your life. You get a new model when things change in your life. And so Madeline's story has a part two. She worked in the county clerk's office and in a clerical position. And she shared with me that when she retired, she was a few years older than I am, that when she retired, she wouldn't have that much of a retirement income from this job. But she had played with the idea of running for office and becoming the county clerk and then serving that term and retiring again. She had been 70 by then uh, at a much improved and enlarged retirement income. And she planned this several years ahead and spent her time working in the clerical position, making contacts and, and learning the business. So she retired from the first job. She ran for office and she was elected. And she served one term as county clerk and retired again and a much improved income. And then she moved to Scottsdale, Arizona to be with family and friends and she's living the good life now. I was so impressed when people can have a plan, when they have that call to greatness. You know, I could, I could be the county clerk, I could get elected. And then she did. And she used so many of the same steps as are in this book. So the second woman I want to share with you today, and some of you know her because she was in the Artist's Way class, is my friend Roseanne who lives in San Diego. Roseanne was widowed in 2012 and she'd had a happy marriage. She'd been married for over 20 years and, and their lifestyle was a large, robust lifestyle. They had a house with a pool. They had company all the time. They entertained. They, they traveled. They had a, uh, her husband had a huge diesel truck to pull their camper and they liked to go camping. And So when he died, it changed everything. And she needed to redefine herself. So she took some time, she took some time packing up the house for one thing and figuring out what she was being called to do for the next stage of her life. She was in her late 60s then. And she sold the house and bought a nice condo on Bankers Hill, which is a nice neighborhood in San Diego. And it's walking distance from Balboa Park where she got a membership in the zoo. She traveled. She stayed active and informed politically. She worked at the polls. She's civic minded. She is engaged in her community and her church. So she 
answered the call into a new version of herself. And I think we all have to do this, maybe more than once, in our adult lives. And she did it with strategy, and she did it. These were both powerful women because they claimed their power, they had a vision, and they were willing to change, and they were willing to accept the good that came their way. So then, I also realized that I had applied many of these same steps and answered my own call to greatness when I decided to become a unity minister. So I'm going to share part of the process I used and point out some of the similarities. The first step in the process is answering the call. I was new to Unity in 1989. I was freshly divorced and freshly sober. I went to Unity Village for the first time to take classes to become a licensed Unity teacher in 1990. And by 1992, I had realized I was being called to be a minister. I also realized that this was down the road a piece. That I, I decided to finish my licensed teacher training. And I knew in the process of early sobriety that I needed to rebuild my life. So even though I made the decision in 92, I did not go to school till 98. There were years of preparation. But you know what they say, once you are committed, everything unfolds on schedule. And that takes us into this, this other step of the process, receptive surrender knowing that God has already made provisions for you to answer your call and that these provisions will be revealed as they are needed. There's a, a famous quote that I like. You may have heard it before. It's by a, a Scottish mountaineer. Oh, his name is William Hutchinson Murray. Until one is committed there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamt would come his way. And that was true for me. When I committed to become a minister in 92, the things that happened between that day and being ordained in 2000 fit this description. Part of it was the software career that I was using to support myself. I became a trainer and I would travel the country uh, training new clients on the um, utility billing package that we, we sold and, and I implemented. And this led me to so many good things. First of all, it led me to becoming an independent consultant, doing exactly that same kind of work. Secondly, when I was still working for the company and going to Unity Village once a year for licensed teacher training, a client in Kansas, because Unity Village is by Kansas City, found out what I was doing and they told me that they would book their annual refresher training to dovetail with my trip to Unity Village so that when I was done with my licensed teacher classes, I'd rent a car and I would drive to Manhattan, Kansas and do 
what they needed done, and they paid for my plane fare every year. Things like that just kept on happening. I got another job as a uh, software person when I was accepted to school in 1998. And I didn't know how I was going to support myself. I was going to, I was 48 years old. I was going to uproot my life from uh, Orlando, Florida, end my career as a software person, like it didn't really end, move to the Kansas City area and go to full-time school. My how was going to pay for it? You know, they say when there seems to be no way, God opens a way. As I was working for that software company, I heard about consultants. Consultants make a lot of money. They don't get perks, though. They don't get health insurance, but I was going to have that provided by the school. So I sent out a bunch of letters to clients in the Kansas City area, and I was contacted by City of Topeka saying, Yep, we'll hire you 75 bucks an hour. And I worked for them for the first year and a half. It's about believing in yourself. I created a strategy. I was newly divorced, as I mentioned, so I paid off my credit cards. I did not run up any additional debt. This was still in Florida. I furnished my home from garage sales. I kept the job before the trainer, the one where I was actually in the office, until I was done with all of the classes I could take at my home church. And I bought a car that I paid off before school, and I drove that car for 17 years. I tell you, you can't beat it, old Toyota Camry. So I did these things, I strategized, I made a plan, I lived out that plan. And here I am. So then the fourth step in this process is modeling greatness. You know, we all leave a, leg a legacy. So this involves being mindful of your legacy. What is your legacy? What is your gift to the world? Could it be the loving children that you raised? Could it be the lives you touched with kindness in your job and elsewhere? Could it be a body of work that you've created, music or sermons or paintings? Could it be people you've taught? Modeling greatness has, is the most to do with living from your power and authenticity. We closed last week's talk with this. Remember that where you are right now in your life, whatever is going on is perfect. Where and how far you go next depends on how much you're willing to release and what you're willing to receive. So be aware of what is calling you to greatness. Be aware of what greatness would mean in your life, in this stage of your life, in the next stage of your life. Surrender to God's goodwill and be willing to receive. Be willing to receive support and supply from unexpected places. Believe in yourself. Believe in your calling. Make a strategy and carry it out. And then allow the ways that you've developed your power to shine forth and bless the world. And thus ends the lesson. God bless you.
do amazing things with the choice each new day brings and with every step you take bless the progress We get to bless our offerings, which are the symbol, the physical symbol of some of your gifts as part of this community, because this is your community and you are what create this ministry that we put out through Zoom and soon to be in person. So it is through your support and we thank you for these gifts. You may mail your checks 
to our P.O. Box at P.O. Box 2176, Citrus Heights, California 95611, or there is a donate button on our homepage on our website. Also, you may find a donate button in our weekly newsletter. So we appreciate your doing that weekly as that is what we count on to sustain our ministry. And now let us draw those offerings into this place in the ethers where we may bless them with unity's prosperity prayer, knowing that divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I choose to give, and all that I am open to receive. And so it is. Thank you, God. Amen. So we have a, a few announcements this morning. The Wednesday night class, Living in the Flow of Life, continues. It'll continue through the end of May. I've been hearing really good things about the class. Uh, I love the way it's structured with the variety of activities and some little art things and uh, things that address a variety of learning styles. Plus, it's based on Eric Butterworth's book, and he is one of a kind. He's truly one of the, uh, of the forefathers of Unity Thought. So it begins at 6.30 for two hours on this same uh, Zoom ID on Wednesday night. Next Sunday will be the third and final um, part of the Sacred Success series based on Barbara Stanny's book, and that part is called The Power. We had the problem, the process, the power. And then for our feature rep, we're going to do Psilocybin Speaks. I had originally said it would be Alex and me. I'm just postponing that. Also, next week, we're having a guest musician, Sky Nelson. You probably remember him. He has been a musician at least three times, and he's been the speaker a couple of times, too. Well, we always enjoy him. You may remember me. He plays the piano and does a lot of his own work. Then after the service today, as always, we invite you, if you're here on Zoom, to stay on, and after we shut down the recordings, we'll have a time where we can chat and, and check in. So at this time, we, we ask our Minister of Music to lead us in the peace song. us together, weave us together in unity and love. Weave, weave, weave us together, weave us together in unity and let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be, with God as Creator, family all are we, let us walk with each other in perfect harmony, let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now With every step I take Let this be my joyful vow To take each moment and live each moment In peace eternally Let there be peace on earth And let it be And now for our prayer for protection, we know that the light of God surrounds us, 
the love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. We got a good thing going on around here. We got a good thing going on around here. You can see it on We got a good